ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world's number one behavioural investing podcast from Doha and Brisbane. Today we have a special guest, lecturer in behavioural finance in the Masters in Finance program at the Universidad del Pacifico in Peru, Sebastian Salazar Nunez. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Will, for having me at the podcast. I work as a, well, as a senior analyst or, or director of research, basically, nowadays. And I do teach behavioral investing uh, a bit at the Universidad del Pacifico, which is it's, it's very curious that I'm here, <laughs> at least for me. It's a perfect fit, actually. Can you just describe a little bit about your basic overview for investing and, and, and also your work background um, and, and the type of work sure. you do? Yes. So uh, currently I'm working as, a, as, as I told you, basically in research. So I'm doing some advising at the moment. And, and my background is somewhat uh, weird because I studied uh, philosophy originally. And then I worked as a journalist for about nine years, 10 years. When I was about around, what was it, 25, 26 years old, I took a course in finance and I sort of fell in love with it. And I started doing more finance, more finance until I, I somehow got my foot on the door. And that's what I've been doing the last three years, basically, doing full on finance. Before that, I was a journalist and I did a lot of uh, economics journalism. So I, I been tangentially there, but not quite as I am today. And regarding my approach, I, I try to be, I was very influenced by value investors originally. Uh, Warren Buffett, I, I somehow got into investing due to him. Um, but I sort of started getting more into behavioral investing and more than behavioral investing, uh, learning about how behavior limits, limits you or investors usually to do stuff that is say optimal or better for you so that made me start delving a little bit deeper into more quantitative strategies where you usually have a checklist or, or you try to take out the human part a little bit away so that's what i usually do what i do day after day in day out is basically uh, see where opportunities might lie i do work in a, in a stock brokerage so i try to sell stuff uh, at the end of the day. But I, I do try to have a lot of meetings with clients to see how they're doing on the behavioral side quite a bit. Because a client usually tells you they wanna, they, they are in for long haul. I have one client that said, yeah, I'm in it for, for five, five years, I don't need my money. And one after one month of 0.05% of negative returns. He, he, was, he was asking for some recommendations to do something else. And it's, it's quite interesting to actually work with people. You have some different, many balls to keep in the air there. You have to look at the quality of the businesses, but it's also, I guess, the quality of the clients that you have too and their attitudes. Yes, I mean, it, there, there's no issue. I mean, you, you can have a great idea and something to invest, but it, it means nothing if the client cannot hold it for... Yeah as long as it needs it it's one year 10 years five years even sometimes when they try to do trade trading and, and it's more technical or something like that more technical analysis if in one week the client usually does not get what he wants it becomes very 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 difficult for them mm. <laughs> to get returns there's a lot of meetings going on there yeah there's a number of issues and topics you just covered there. Hearing you talk about your experience as a journalist, I think those skills might come in very handy in the sorts of forensic work sometimes you have to do. So I think that the, the best thing I got from that experience, which, I mean, I still do some journalistic work, was the fact that you sort of become very, very much attuned to not believing what you hear, uh, usually, <laughs> or what you say. So you, you, you become a, a bit cynical, but that helps because you usually dig a little deeper. And what sometimes I feel is it's very, people don't use it. I think that's what Philip Fisher said in, in his book, is that there are a lot of people that you can mainly just ask. I mean, just pick up the phone and ask, how is this stuff for you? Does, this, does these products work for you? Why do you use them? Why do you not use them? Not only the, the executives there, but... I don't know how a, how a drink is. Is it good? Have you, how long have you been drinking it? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, in an uh, energy drink, for example, 10 years, 15 years, uh, five years. Why did it change? 
and to regular people and even, even clients sometimes they just go no i don't like that product <laughs> because it has yz or something and it's like okay so maybe there's something there that is not usually reflected in the information that you get because it's very subjective another thing i wanted to pick up on about your introductory remarks it seems so common also in some of the things that dan crosby says who actually wrote a book called the behavioral investor his approach is with a phd in psychology and knowing enough to write a book about behavioral investing his first sort of response to all of this similar to you is to try to take the human element out of investing and i just think that's so funny here we are trying to make ourselves experts in, in how to i guess overcome or at least be aware of the challenge the behavioral challenges the first thing we do is to try to remove humans and human decision making yeah it's and it's it's weird because uh, I remember when I give lectures, the class for behavioral finance, I realized, uh, when was it last year, is that we usually explain stuff as if we need to get to an optimum. So like, why why are we deviating from an efficient market hypothesis or, or why are our decisions not efficient? And well, we're humans usually, so our decisions need not be <laughs> efficient, but uh, sustainable. So, so there's a lot of that going on, I think, because, I mean, those quantitative investment firms, I don't know if, I mean, the last year they've suffered quite a lot and they have very, very intelligent people. So what, at the end, what you need is somehow to be, feel, feel confident that you can stay the course where you are, which is the most important thing, I think. That role of yours is acting as a, financial advisor, but also as, as a counselor of some sort, that um, behavioral coach or a psychologist, getting people in the right mindset more than just thinking about the actual financial results. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that going on. It, it depends where, if I'm talking from theory or, or from experience, clients usually, sometimes they just want reassurance. What type of things would you teach in your behavioral finance course that you, you teach at the mm -hmm. Universidad del Pacifico? Sure. So we, we rely heavily because uh, the program sort of requires it uh, to teach stuff that is somewhat aligned to the CFA curriculum. But what, what I enjoy the most teaching is basically about biases to the students. I mean, all the biases they have, all the biases I have, I usually use the, the same examples over and over again as for example, when I say that I want to, I know exactly how I'm supposed to lose weight, but I cannot, for the life of me, lose weight. <laughs> but I know exactly what to do. So, so that's that's uh, something that, that usually I use to try to tell tell them that you might know stuff, but it's difficult to implement in reality. And that's on the one side. And I, I do like to do checklists quite a lot. So, so okay, so you're doing an investment. Have you checked this? That? Oh, yeah. What do you know that the market does not know? How confident are you? Why are you so confident? So there's a, a couple of, let's say 15 to 20 questions. It depends on each and everyone, uh, what they feel comfortable with so that they know they can go forward and not be subject to, for example, hindsight bias or framing or, or whatever. I enjoy reading about biases quite a lot. Bias has come up quite often in the different checklists and the different behaviors you hear about. I think and Will, you'll correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't read as much on this topic as you, but I don't think they indicate almost like a gym routine approach where you need to put in a certain number of hours each week to achieve certain outcomes. I haven't read anything in any of the books saying, you know, have you spent at least a minimum of three weeks and 40 hours each week researching this company before you make an investment in it. Have you, either Will or Sebastian, thought about that in terms of behavioral investing? A lot of it comes on the negative side, taking away the human aspect to it, but where is the positive side to being human and you can control sure. investing? So I, 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 to be honest, I, I haven't read that much research or any research over in, in that particular aspect, I would think that the better your process is to make investment decisions, the better the outcome will be on average, I guess. Maybe you don't need one week or two weeks or three weeks or one month or five months each time. But the fact that you do it like that means that you uh, have a discipline and the discipline might help you. It might also uh, limit your upside, most likely, sometime around. But I th I'm thinking it should help 
to avoid a big uh, downswing, but I'm not that familiar with that research. Sure. So with this approach in mind, are there any companies that you can suggest attractive at the moment? What are they? Or alternatively, can you think of any companies trading at the moment that you do not think are good investments? Okay. So that's, I need to do a disclaimer usually. Because I, I, don't, I don't know if I can or should, or even if it works since this podcast, I don't know where it's recorded. So I don't know if I can, I can say it or not. Um, but, to yeah, so what I, you feel you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but so this, what I'm about to say is for entertainment purposes only <laughs> uh, and should not be regarded as any sort of advice. But yeah, I usually like to navigate micro caps or, or, or very small caps. Because I feel like there's that's a place where I can get personally some returns that I don't basically I don't, I don't want to compete with Goldman Sachs over or with Kathy Woods over 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 Tesla or something like that. I mean, like it, it's unlikely that I'll be the one left standing as as recent events have shown last week. No, so I usually try to be in a places where I can have some advantages. So I like I've always liked having said that I always like there's one company that's called Network One Technology. It, it hasn't gone anywhere in the last uh, two years. I liked it five years ago, I think. And it went somewhat, it, it had a rally for a while, but it, it lost. It's a very weird company that basically buys patents about data and data management and data organization. <laughs> what it does is it usually sues <laughs> Google or Facebook for infringing up, um, on their uh, algorithm or, or, or their patent. And they usually settle and they get some big reward sometimes. But the thing is, it's, it's a very, it depends on the, on, the, on the CEO quite a bit. He also has about 30% shares, I think. But I, I like it as a, as a business model because if nothing happens, it's not that expensive. But if it goes well, you can have high moments. I had three or four in the last five years. So is it uh, called Network think, Technologies? Yeah, and, yeah, no, no. It's uh, Network One Technologies. So Network NC, One Technologies. IP, uh, NTIP. NTIP, yeah. So it hasn't, so I remember it before, uh, so five years ago. And I remember it from the FCU yeah, from 2015 and it went up and then it went down, I think, because they lost one patent or one, one uh, case that was very big. So they, they, they fell quite a bit. Yeah. But I like that. Uh, I don't like overvalued stocks nowadays. I could say that I think Tesla is overvalued, but I thought Tesla was overvalued when it was cheaper than it is today. So I might be wrong on that. And What's yeah, the P-E ratio? The P-E ratio from Tesla right now. No, 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 it's from MTIP. Uh, give me a second, I don't know. It was, it was right now, give me a second for, to, to check it. But so, yeah, so I, I, well, the other thing is I like EDS quite a bit. I like paws for pets, everything relating with pets. Ah, uh, yeah. A couple, a couple of years ago, I thought that was a, a nice, even more during COVID times that a lot of people would spend more time with their pets and spend their money with their pets, which, <laughs> well, is basically what I do. <laughs> but, yeah. So Fry's PE, it, at the moment it does not have a PE from what I'm, so I'm, I'm I, Maybe they don't have any earnings. So it, it has a, a price to book from 1.8, EV to sales, 8.0. 8 point, yeah, 8 and I don't know why there is no PE ratio. That's weird. I do remember it not being that high, but maybe yeah. Maybe a case that they haven't had any earnings since last. Yeah, or maybe maybe mm -hmm. they had, yeah. But yeah, so I like that one. There was one additional, oh, well, I like Oracle quite a bit. I think that's, that's a nice company in general. I don't know where it will be, uh, but I like it. Because I, like, I uh, okay, so, so yeah, not available. I think they had an, a negative quarter, most likely. So that, that makes it makes it impossible to calculate yeah. the PE ratio. But from what I'm seeing right now in Yahoo Finance, it has a it has a beta of 0 0.28. So that's it's not very correlated. If you believe that much in beta, I don't know. Yeah. Considering your investing approach, Sebastian, what do you think the key challenges for investors using it? For example, is it challenging to stay focused when you're doing analysis, for example? Is there enough data? What about the time frames and behavioral challenges? Sure. I mean, I think that the main issue usually is behavioral challenges. You can have a very nice analysis and not being able to hold it or not being able to believe in it fully. And that will uh, surely be detrimental to you. Regarding the analysis, uh, 
I think I don't I don't recall right now how much if it's a bias, but if you have too much information, it's a, it's bad as well. If you have too much information and if you have too little information, so you have to find a, a nice middle, which is weird because it's not the same amount of information every time. So I might need, for example, to uh, be confident about say Facebook about three months of, of, of analysis, for example, and, and, and diving into the, into the 10 case. But for a more simple company, I might need two weeks, three weeks, or if it's a very complicated company, even more. It, it, I think it depends. So, so the, the main issue is you have to have a good process, but at the same time, be flexible enough to know that there's, if you, have, you spend too much time, it's also painful for you because you might miss something. So yeah, I, if I were a master at this, I'd probably have some uh, rule of thumb. I am not. <laughs> I, I, I always try to learn. So I, I say I've made mistakes. I made them constantly, but I, I try to improve upon them. How do you try to overcome those challenges? Okay. So it depends. So if I'm doing something for the company, for the program, I have a more safe approach to, to doing any, any type of analysis so that I can uh, protect the downside, the risk of the company, my company or where I work. Uh, of the client, of the client needs. So I need to adapt that. It makes learning from mistakes quite a bit harder because people change quite a lot during one year, during two years. So what I learned, for example, from you today, if I try to apply it next time in say six months or three months or one year, it might not be the same. I might not need to be as careful or I need, I might need to be even more careful when I do an investment of the same size. So it's very hard. So what I usually try to do when it, with clients is I try to have meetings. I try to understand not only if they have the money, which I assume they do, but how are they doing at home? <laughs> uh, what's going on outside of investing? Uh, why they want to invest, for example, right now? There, I've had a lot of calls uh, in the last week asking for uh, some stocks that had a high volatility and returns for some people. But at the same time, people do not want to, to take the risk. So for clients, I usually try to have a lot of meetings to understand where they're sitting. From that, I can learn where I did not hear enough or did not take sufficient notes on what they wanted. Also, sometimes, and I feel sometimes like, uh, do you remember Dr. House or House MD, where he says, you never talk to a patient because the patient will always lie. Sometimes I need to be a, a bit skeptic of what I'm hearing because what they tell you is not necessarily what they want. So it makes learning very difficult. So that's why we do things. That's in a team. the worst kind of client you could possibly have. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> but that's that's the thing. They can't tell you. Performance <laughs> returns. So, and and it's it's quite difficult to know what you want. And yeah. Even even for ourselves, I think. So you think yeah. you want something, and you get it, and it's not like yeah, it's not exactly what I did, what I wanted. So it happens even when you order, for example, a coffee or. Or uh, I don't want to go too much off topic, but you start dating someone and you think she or he is what you want, but at the end, it's not quite what you wanted. So, so you need to learn about yourself as well. So there's a whole process going on there. For myself, I try to basically have a checklist. I, uh, there's a book that's called the Investment Checklist. This checklist Investing, I think it was. Is. I'm not quite sure. And they have some sort of checklist. And I adapted them. I usually, for example, since I'm a bit impulsive, I usually, my last thing to check is wait. So have you waited a couple of days before taking this position? Okay, so if I say yes, then okay, so I can go. But it makes learning usually making, adding something from the checklist or taking something out of the checklist. And that's basically, it. it's hard, I think, because you forget stuff that you think you learned as well. At least that happens for me. Do you think that there's differences between cultures in the way they invest and their attitude and, and behaviors towards investing? So you're in Peru, so you would have a feel for it there. You've had much exposure to other cultures um, or not, but appreciate your insights into that yeah so i do think there's a there's a there's some some issues i have a couple of clients well they're not my clients but i've worked with a couple of clients one is i think european and the other one is uh, from the u.s the way they approach investing is quite different from the peru one. the peru which is quite weird are very risk averse so peru has a very very nice fixed income for example i don't want to do any sort of advertising or false advertising and disclaimer here, insert here. But where I work, 
there was a time a couple of years back where you could get fixed income on short-term papers for 8% in US dollars. And that's quite a lot, right? Uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that government backed? No, it's not, it's not government. It's, it's, those are actually, uh, on a risk-adjusted basis, I think they, don't, uh, they aren't as good, but, but they do give you, I mean, they do give you that return, or they did give you that return. They're usually small companies in Peru that have very big clients. So, uh, for example, if I'm, if I'm doing a comparison, toilet paper provider of Facebook, for example. So, you know, and it, it has worked with Facebook for five years or something like that. So, you know, they're going to pay. And sometimes they just need bridge loans or something like that. So, you get very high returns. For a very small amount of time, so the the analyzed basis, uh, the analyzed return looks quite good. But if, if if I were an institutional investor, I don't know if I could put that much money into a company where if I put 100 millions, I, uh, it's too much. They don't need that much. So basically, that's a it's a size thing, I think, and a liquidity thing there. But seeing as those returns can be made in Peru, in U.S. dollars, and even deposit four percent sometimes in USD. It makes it very hard for me to recommend or say you, we should look at, at, a, at a company or an industry that is poised to get around 8% or 9% <laughs> real returns USD in five years with more volatility. People like their safety because I, I'm not quite sure why they like that. Even younger people. I mean, I'm not that old, but people are very, very risk averse here. And I think way more than, for example, in, in the United States, there was one study made, I'm forgetting where it was from, I think Credit Suisse, that compared uh, attitudes with respect to risk in different countries. And emerging countries usually were way more, and Latin America specifically, was way more risk averse than, say, the United States or Europe. So that affects how you approach investing because most people does not want to lose a penny. Uh, yeah, I, I can it's, sympathize with that. I mean, if I don't think in my lifetime, my investing lifetime at least, I've ever seen a fixed income return of 8%. I could totally, I reckon I would probably take that over the uncertainties, even based on the training that I've had and the exposure to the markets over the past year and a half, researching 100 plus companies. If I could just forget it all, and reliably get 8%. <laughs> I can sympathize with more, more naive uh, investors' attitude there. Sure, yeah, that, that's an issue usually. And I don't know if this isn't, this isn't any real effect, but I do think that the exchange rate plays a big role, for example, in, in countries like Peru or uh, I don't know how it is in other countries. Because I was once, where was it? I was in Switzerland, I think, a couple of years back. And everything was like the same price I pay here, but with Swiss francs. So what usually cost me 10 solids here was around 40 solids there. So that has a, a very big effect, I think, when you ask people to put their money in USD because they fear a little bit that it's too expensive for one side. But at the same time, because we had, uh, I don't know if you follow, but Argentina has hyperinflation, Venezuela has hyperinflation, but we used to have that, quite a high hyperinflation, actually, in the, in the 80s, 90s. So a lot of people here have their savings in US dollars. That's has been reduced, I think, to about 30% or 40% of the whole money. But it was 80 because you couldn't buy anything. It was like Venezuela for a while. Yeah, I don't know. People are, are have been very affected in their last times here. It has an effect on their every decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm tempted almost to have a whole interview with you just about how investing happens in Peru. As, a, as an Australian, all I've really known about Peru was the Machu Picchu tourist site, and that's about it. So it's really fascinating to hear, you know, to have an intelligent discussion with a, an investor all the way from over there. Yeah. So what about mentors? Is there a, an investing scene that you're participating in there? Do you have, are there conferences? Do you have meetups? Um, and from those, uh, do you have any mentors that you talk with? So, yeah, my experience is, is quite weird in that respect. So I, I, I don't have uh, any mentors. I wish I had. So if anyone wants to be my mentor, uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm open to it. Come um, on the podcast every uh, month. But, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I do, I, I, what I do quite a bit is, and this is weird because I actually learned this from my mom, is that I usually ask people, I mean, like, 
So what are you doing? Oh, can I go? And people usually usually just say, yeah, you can go. So there are a lot of events going on right now. I was, uh, as I told you, a, a finance and economics journalist. So that usually gave me access to most, if not everything that was going on. But at the same time, it made it, it, made it very difficult for me to approach people because I had to usually uh, keep in check that my uh, my not my integrity, but but it didn't look as though I was being biased or or anything else. So I didn't have at the beginning someone I could feel I could go to and not make it couldn't look as though as I was somehow benefiting them by having yeah. more stories or something like that. So I, yeah. I, I tried it to always be uh, very responsible with that. So, so I did, so, but I yeah. enjoy, for example, I watch the modern analysis every day. I mean, Michael Mobison and uh, FinTwit, the FinTwit community in Twitter is amazing. I enjoy uh, Clifford Asmus very much. He's very funny. And, and when he goes on, on rants, it's also very funny. <laughs> uh, recently, uh, I've started reading a, a little bit more on the research side uh, on factors. There's a, a, a German professor, I think. He's from Roveco Investments, uh, Matthias Hanawa. I don't know. I just, I just try to learn whatever from whatever I can get. So I'm very eclectic that way. But I don't have a formal, a formal mentor. And I do need to say, I think this is a, most likely a country policy that we also have very good food. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we usually say that. I don't know why. But it's good food. <laughs> so what's like the, the best Peruvian stock in the past sort of 20 years that an outsider should know about if I was to know the history of investing in Peru? So, yeah, it depends on what you want. But I'd say... The best stock, well, I think the like stock companies. that is today more is uh, Credit Corp. It's uh, BAP, most likely. Could you Credit say that Corp again? Is, uh, Credit Corp, uh, B-A-P-S is the ticket. BAP. P-A-T-S? No, B-A-P, it's, so I'm going to write it here. The B yeah, uh, B-A-P. Okay. I mean, I like it. I like it because it's so big. <laughs> it, 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 it handles about, I'd say, most likely half of all the deposits in Peru. Wow. Yeah, I, I could be wrong though, but it, it's uh, revenue-wise, it's at least twice as big as the next competitor. It has so many things going on, so that makes it that makes it quite difficult to to assess. But I, I enjoy. I mean, I like banking stocks in yeah. general. Uh, the other the other thing, Peru has very nice companies. Eh, okay, companies I'd say. I think mining stocks, mining stocks, yeah. because we 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 have. A uh, very big reserve in copper, uh, gold. I think in copper we're the second largest producer after Chile, and gold I think we're fifth or sixth. We also have nickel, everything that somewhat, somehow, or somewhat uh, obtained from the ground. Okay, so sim we have similar it. to Australia then, in that regard. Yeah, it's yeah, similar to Australia. Yeah, a lot of materials. But I think or... Australia. Is, well, I think Australia is. is, is I mean, has has better. How do you say? A better market in general. We have a very small market. Which and you, you have the, the, the BVL exchange there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's That's the B only one. We used ah, to have right. two. Now we have one. Bolsa de Valores so think, de Lima. Yeah. So that's okay. basically uh, Lima Stock Exchange. So not, nothing, nothing too fancy there. Uh, but there are about, I might be wrong, but I think there are about 200 companies coding in the, in the BVL. Okay. If, if. 200. Some of those are EDFs that uh, are quoting from the U.S. that have here a, a ticker to to get more tax benefits. So you can sure. like Apple with for uh, for us. I mean, no, no, not for outside yep. investors. Uh, yeah, we we have similar things in Australia. Does Vanguard have a index fund in Peru? I think not. I think the MSCI has one. It's the EPU. I think EPU. Uh, yeah, iShares EPU MSCI Peru EDF. Cool. So if you if you look at it, it's yeah, not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. Oh, but it's fascinating. But maybe it's at the turning point. It's about to skyrocket. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would love to know that. It's sometimes sometimes uh, what happens at work is people call to say to know what the exchange rate will be the next day. And, and we usually say, if we knew that, I wouldn't be working here. I mean, like, yeah. I, <laughs> but yeah, I, I cannot make uh, statements about the future. Disclaimer yeah, okay. and such. 
Well, maybe, maybe you can make a statement about the future, about yourself and where you plan on being in, in five years from now. Wow. Yeah, so five years from now, I hope I will be married. That's first of all. I hope my, I, I have a, one child at least and five dogs. But besides uh, that, professionally, <laughs> uh, I'd love to, I'd love to get, get some international exposure, learn a little bit more in other countries. I've been quite interested lately in, in maybe pursuing some studies in, in Germany or the U.S. Why uh, and, and well, So yeah, I'm from a German school, so I speak German. And I lived in Heidelberg a couple of years. I tried to study classical philology for a while. I, I, I was a very humanistic type of guy for a while. Mm. I like the humanities. You're very eclectic, uh, Sebastian. It's great. You've gone from... <laughs> reporting to investing you're a philosopher it's great you're a German like speaker this. yeah and yeah but I'm a, a I, I, I'd like curious. to be somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be somewhere else I guess uh, eventually I'd like to have a little more I mean to learn how competitive it can be in other places you learn most from the people who that are around you usually I would love to be with people that are way better than me so I can become a little bit better and, and maybe get some advantages there. Yeah, sure. We, we, we're all looking for that uh, exposure and challenge. And that's also part of the reason why we, or at least a benefit we've had from this podcast is showing how much further ahead so many people are than us. <laughs> yeah, that's um, it's amazing. It's a, and I, I've, I've seen, well, not seen, but heard some of the interviews. And there are a couple of, of interviews, I don't call the names right now, that I could not understand. I mean, there was one about ergodic returns, and I was like, okay, so I need to <laughs> review my math uh, again. But yeah, as long as you learn, it's, it's quite all right for me. It's really opened our eyes, literally all around the world. Before we cover off the last item on the agenda, I just wanted to insert one more question about stocks. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm doing an advanced value investing course at the moment under Kenneth Marshall, who was the professor for the initial value investing course that I did two years ago. And the latest business that we looked at was which is real estate business in the UK. And I was just reminded of the dominant real estate online real estate platform in Australia, realestate.com.au. They both are growing extremely quickly. They have extremely high return on capital employed. So I'm just wondering if there are any stocks on the BVL, which mm -hmm. uh, are in the property space and uh, whether they're any good. Sure. And there was, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, if, uh, there was one company that was very dominant in everything that was construction, basically. But it was caught in the graph scandal from Odebrecht. So one of the, the, the cute things or nice things about living in a third world country is that we usually get politics very mixed with business sometimes. And in this case, there was a very big uh, corruption scandal from Brazil that had effects here. So Granja Montero, G-Y-M, so G -Y -M, was a, a, a quite a decent stock. Actually, it was a very dominant player in construction. It did a lot of, uh, well, public investment projects. They were caught in this graph scandal where they were accused of, I don't know if they were found guilty, because those things, for some reason here, take 10 years. They were accused of buying basically government officials to get projects or something like that. And so the whole construction yeah, industry it went down for a while. And that was 2016, if I don't recall correctly. So they haven't quite recovered, but that's from the construction standpoint. There isn't an online a platform that is quite as dominant. I know a couple of those, but for yeah. example, what the most dominant one is owned by media conglomerate. Okay, so it's uh, like And media hasn't been doing well, so okay. it sort of gets mix, mixed up in everything. So well, that's basically the stuff? issue. There's the other thing that it's El Comercio. I'm going to give you, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the ticker. I used to work for them, actually, yeah. for a while politics sorry i'm putting you on the oh. spot here sebastian but i'm really curious <laughs> <laughs> no no issue no issue uh, and actually they were uh, when i was a journalist at, at, at a news anchor they were the owners of the channel uh what's the ticker i don't recall right now but uh, i can send it to you guys later sure. so yeah. they 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 have an issue because uh, well advertising in legacy media it's called right now no? legacy stuff we have legacy mm. stuff. 
So it has been declining quite a lot, quite a lot. So same in Australia. Due to that, again. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Google, actually, and, and everything. It, it, uh, Twitter even is taking everything up, every uh, available publicity space. And so they are re uh, the industry is rearranging itself to be most likely a little bit smaller than it is right now. They most likely have to do some cuts and stuff like that. But the thing is, since they own uh, the platform that has uh, this uh, very big um, real estate uh, buying and selling, it's difficult to, to measure or to invest because you would need to, you cannot invest in that separately. You, you have to buy the whole package, mm. which is complicated because, I mean, for it's crazy because they for, for a couple of years or even 10 years or five, they had, they operated for, I don't know why, an amusement park. For example, so why why is media having an amusement park? So uh, yeah. I, I'm not quite sure. So they made some acquisitions uh, that were weird, and they the the ownership stake there is is controlled by the family that owns it. So it's very it's a very difficult uh, stock to own uh, in general. Public. And yeah, they're always. I mean, I think this happens everywhere else. But I mean, since Peru is smaller, there are always discussions within the because they're like. The grandchildren of the in, of the grandchildren of the initial founder. So okay. there's like 300 right now. Yeah. So they have to take the decisions, and it's family, and with with family, everything becomes more complicated. Uh, but that's, uh, that's just, a nice company. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, media companies on the BVL, I've got here Union and Dina de Cementos S A A. I don't know. No, but that that no, you know, and Dina Cementos. That's uh, give me a second. That's uh, a cement company. It, uh, it, uh, okay. <laughs> Language barrier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's and, and the BVL just updated their, their website, so it's a little complicated right now. For example, company it's, it's quite weird. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it an oligopoly, but there are like three big cement companies, and one has the south, one has the middle, and one has the north part, and they usually don't mess with each other's regions. Their stock is not doing well. Anyway. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, anything, anything that's uh, related to construction is right now very much. I mean, we've we've had. I think we had. I think that the worst or next to the worst economic results last year. Uh, it's expected that we fall 2020 about 13, uh, 13 percent, or okay. GDP contract 13 yeah. percent. I think it's going to be a little bit higher, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the coronavirus. Yeah, due to coronavirus, we're expected to, to rebound now about eight percent. But the thing is, we've just entered last week in a lockdown again. For example, I can only work, uh, move around in, in, the, in the city because I have a pass. Uh, if I didn't have the pass, I couldn't move. I, wow. I have people have only one hour a day to just walk around in their neighborhood or something like that. That's severe. Uh, yeah. Thankfully, the, the enforcement is not what it used to be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's pretty severe. Uh, that's due to the second wave. So coronavirus has, in the last two years uh, had a, a very, very big impact. And, and a lot of corporate people uh, have had to uh, drive up their schedule for digitalizing everything, mm. which is quite nice for me. But yeah, uh, so... Yeah, we're, we're still struggling with that, actually. Peru, 70% of informal market. The labor force is about 70% uh, informal. Did, did you say 70% informal? Yeah, 70. <laughs> Around. Well, se seven zero, that's basically untaxed. Uh, untaxed, uh, unregulated, or not only unregulated and untaxed, but uh, no labor contracts, uh, yeah. not binding by law, uh, okay. no minimum wage. Uh, wow. So everything like that. Is that yeah. also unbanked? I mean, I, uh, a part of it, a part of it is, uh, but not not entirely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, because that's a different there, there has some, yeah. yeah, that's different. That's different. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah uh, if if we talk about informal markets here, it's quite. <laughs> uh, that could take quite a while. So I'll, I'll leave it at. I, I'm going on tangents right now. Yeah. Oh, I, but I love them all. I, I feel we should do more interviews like this, Ben. <laughs> but, uh, Okay, um, so I'm looking, I'm on the bvl.com.pe website. That's the mm -hmm. the website of the exchange, right? For people yeah, who, yeah. who want to go and make some very unique and interesting investments. <laughs> I don't know if interactive brokers and those sorts yeah, of sites BVL. would necessarily so, provide you, access. You, yeah, I don't know as well. 
Uh, I think they, should, they they probably might. Okay. Uh, they they have a lot of stuff. I'm not sure, but they have a lot. I mean, if you want to know where where the companies are, you just just below the BVL at the at the left side, there's Empresas, so that's companies, and below that there's Listao, which is a list, and then you get the uh, search bar, and then you can see a little bit. But uh, for example, what what I, what is also very very difficult for people who invest here is there's a there's a lack of liquidity in the market, so there's not much float going on, not much yeah. float. I mean, and that usually, I mean, it doesn't matter if you think a company is gonna go up or down, you 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 just can't find shares, or if you find some shares, you drive up the price because you bought them. So it that makes it it's very challenging, I'd say. Mm. For example, most most people usually in my Work. They usually ask me about U.S. stocks, I mean, Europe stocks, sometimes because no of the liquidity basis. <laughs> no, but Australia has very nice stocks. I, mean, I think the main issue there, and it's, it's the tax implications of, of buying somewhere else. Yeah. That's yeah. the main issue everywhere, I think. Yeah, I've just changed this. So I've, I've, I've selected just ones from the industrial sector from the list of stocks. I've got Ali Corp, Composer. There's so many. I, have, I can't understand any of the language, but oh, it's fascinating. Sure. Alicorp, uh, Alicorp is, is quite a, it's, it's a very good company. They, okay. I, I'm not entirely sure how much they have, but they are most likely the, the, the number one uh, provider of, of food. So everything okay. you buy is somehow usually from Alicorp. All right. Well, uh, how, about, how about we put it through the framework, Ben, and we can have a, a few minutes on, on Alicorp in our next episode. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds <laughs> good. We'll try and get the annual report. By the way, I, I forgot to tell you this, but I, I am as well in the in the uh, value investing workshop that's going oh, on really? right now for the first time. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I, for, I forgot completely well, that well. I had it, but yeah, I have to check. <laughs> Do a lot of work. Actually, I've missed the last week completely. Uh, there you go. How interesting. This is really. It's funny the synchronicities with this podcast. Uh, it's it's amazing. I just yeah. Got the, yeah that's, um, it's, but it was advertised for the next one to be enrolled in as well recently. There's a March session. Yeah, from from what I see in that in that uh, thread or there are, there's a lot of people that know what they're talking about. Oh yeah, a lot of people. Sebastian, how do you find the course? You can. I enjoy it actually. I, I enjoy. I mean, I I'm still getting used to to the fact that the, the course is very interactive with the platform. So it's not, I mean, like I'm, I'm used to, well, a more traditional type of course, if, if you want to call it like that. So mm. I'm getting into the thing of, of commenting and, and reading and, and doing the work, actually. But but yeah, I, enjoy, I mean, uh, I loved what happened with what some of this, I mean, the, the first one, the analysis done there was quite nice. Mm. And uh, I mean, the way people approach it was quite different. And uh, some people had a lot of experience with it. I do not have that much experience with it. I mean, as a user, but at the same time, there's a lot of, of detailed information about how, for example, some disclosures were made or not, or if that is, should be included in the accounting for uh, for operating lease or for finance lease or, or whatever like that. Yes, so I enjoy good old it. operating leases. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> CFA, CFA all the way. Yeah, um, man. Curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> that's also something that I've, I'm proud of from that I'm proud that I'm able to, well, you know, because of the course and the book that he wrote that I can in a limited form, at least cobble together some sort of capitalization of those operating leases. All right. Thanks yeah. so much for your time, Sebastian. That's almost an hour now. Thank you. If people want to know more about you or get in touch or follow you, how can they do that? Sure. Okay. So uh, first, they can uh, send me an email. My email is S, as in Sebastian, Salazar, A S A L A Z A R N, as in new. So S, S Salazar N at uh, J H U dot E D U, John Hopkins. I I'm in Twitter. Uh, my handle is Nanu, it's N A A N U R L L. So apparently, I do everything very difficult <laughs> for people to contact me. N-A-A-N-U-R-L-L? Um, uh, N-U-L-L. N-A-A-N-U-L-L. Yeah. So I usually, I mean... N-A-N-U-L-L. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, I'm going to write it here. Yeah, maybe I should do it. Uh, <laughs> so I usually Got try it. to think of my, my, my Twitter feed is, is stuff that ha is happening in Peru. Uh, so it, it sometimes oscillates between Spanish stuff, some German stuff sometimes, and a lot of tweet either 
uh, meme responses or likes or something like that. <laughs> We've all got it. Have so. memes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. I just um, followed so you. That's it. Thank you. I'll follow you back then. Give me a all right. Nice, man. Um, all right. Well, we'll can we can we put your email address and your Twitter handle in the show notes for people? Sure. Yeah. Please do. Give me a second. Great. So cool, also, so. if yep. if so, give me some. Okay. So this is one, and I'm putting in the chat if anyone is interested in. Although I don't know how they will do it tax tax efficiently. And so I work as a stockbroker, so at the end, I need to some, somehow sell a little bit. So if anyone's interested in, in, in very uh, good uh, USD returns <laughs> with very nice yields, I've, I've also added my, my work email. Please feel free if anyone wants to reach out or even you guys. I mean, I, it, it, I don't like to sell stuff, actually, even though I'm doing it right now. I do, I do know that there are people who, who love to get some 3% USD or 4% USD yields, uh, very secure. So yeah, we, yeah. We've, all got a, we've all got a business and we're all earning a living. So that's fine to, to uh, plug, plug what you're doing. And I think also what you've, no, I mean, I, as you, you, you also can offer not only stock tips, but also assistance to, to people to um, yeah, maintain I enjoy the right behavior and the right attitude yeah. to actually stay in the market long enough to, to realize those returns. So, yeah, that's, the, that's, I think that's the main part. I mean, if people just want to talk, I am all there for to talk and I enjoy talking as you, as you've experienced right now. Uh. <laughs> cool. well, maybe, um, I think Ben's got to get on with his, his day. So, but I've, I've posted the link there also for Alicorp. So I think what I'll do at least yeah. is um, put it through the framework and maybe we can discuss it in another episode. Sure, that makes sense. Cool. I might put MTIP <laughs> through the framework as well and see how that looks. Ah, uh, yeah. Please do not. I don't think that's going to do well. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's always good to get an understanding of a company and what it does. So uh, that's, that's the job for Will is to do Alicorp and my job is to do MTIP. There's nothing like a patent shark or a patent troll to be uh, a, a, as a candidate for a value investment. <laughs> Which is what it sounds like <laughs> TIP is. So. Could, it could yeah. be a short opportunity. Yeah. That's... yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe it could be. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows nowadays how the, how the stock market works, actually? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's been crazy. Cool. Thanks, Sebastian. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Have a nice, I think, evening and day. Uh, respectively. Yeah, you too. Uh, you too, man. It's been <laughs> very, very nice talking to you. Okay, bye. Bye.